Hello everyone and welcome to B4.2 which is ecological niches in IB biology. So this topic is a bit of a mess so I've reorganized it to try and make more sense out of it. So every species in an ecosystem fulfills a unique role and that's its ecological niche. So ecological niches consist of both biotic and abiotic elements. So for example, remember organisms have ranges of tolerance for abiotic variables that determine the habitat of a species. So that's the area in the ecosystem in which it lives. Also, to minimize competition for food, species specialize by developing adaptations, and that changes the ecological niche. And then finally, species use other species. Uh, so, for example, you can use a tree for support, uh, or plants use animals for dispersal of seeds, and that also conditions the ecological niche. Therefore, the ecological niche, it's a very hard concept to understand, but it's multidimensional. And unless all dimensions of the niche are satisfied, a species cannot survive, grow, or reproduce. So leading on from this, um, again, the range of tolerances is, uh, is the fundamental niche of this species, okay? So the fundamental niche basically means that if the species were living without any competitors, it would occupy that entire fundamental niche because it can live within that range. So for example, you can see here, right, um, within this range of salinity uh, and temperature, this species of fish can live. So again, with no competitors, it would occupy the entire fundamental niche. But since there is almost always competition, uh, that means that a species is normally excluded from parts of its fundamental niche. So the actual extent of the potential range that it occupies is called its realized niche. And you can see here, for example, um, at this range of salinity, prey species cannot tolerate it. And then here, parasites are common at higher temperature, meaning they are excluded by competition. So where the fundamental niches of two species overlap, and this is important, one species is expected to exclude the other part of its range by competition. So one option is that one of them gets completely excluded, or they both restrict each other to a part of the fundamental niche. So they each develop a realized niche. Hopefully that's clear. So now let's look at some characteristics of the ecological niches. So living organisms can be placed in three categories according to their oxygen requirements. So some organisms are obligate aerobes. That means that they require a continuous oxygen supply. They need to live in oxic environments. So that's all animals and plants, for example. And you can see in these tubes, right, oxygen is up here and then they're submerged in water. So aerobes will go up to find the oxygen. Then um, facultative anaerobes use oxygen if available, so they can live in both oxic and anoxic environments. As you can see, they're spread out uh, completely in this tube. And then obligate anaerobes are killed by oxygen, so they can only live in anoxic environments. Um, as you can see here, they're at the bottom. And uh, examples include the tetanus bacterium or methanogenic archaea. Great, so photosynthesis. So photosynthesis occurs only in two of the three domains of life because it is used by plants and algae, for example, as you can see here, and those are eukaryotes, but it's also used by bacteria, uh, in this case, the cyanobacteria. However, it is not used by archaea. And remember, photosynthesis involves using energy from sunlight and taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to produce sugars, amino acids, and other carbon compounds. Right, so now let's look at nutrition. So there's heterotrophic nutrition, where you obtain food by eating it, and autotrophic nutrition, where you produce it yourself. Some organisms can utilize both. So for example, Euclina gracilis, which you can see here, has chloroplasts, uh, so it carries out photosynthesis, but it can also feed on detritus, so outside food. Um, and then there's facultative mixotrophs, okay, so those can use either heterotrophic or autotrophic nutrition, and then there's obligate mixotrophs, so the same pattern as with the oxygen requirements. In this case, the obligates cannot grow unless they utilize both modes of nutrition. It's most likely because they get different nutrients from each type. Good. Then a type of heterotrophic nutrition, okay, this is important to classify things correctly because there's a lot of terms that are thrown at you in this topic. So holotrophic nutrition is a type of heterotrophic nutrition, um, and it basically means that digestion happens internally. So once the food has been ingested, uh, so the food is swallowed before being fully digested. And the sequences in this case are ingestion, digestion, absorption, assimilation, assimilation is when you use digested foods to synthesize micro macromolecules, and then egestion, which is getting rid of undigested material from the end of the gut. So holozoic is what we do, for example. But then we also have saprotrophic nutrition. So this is another type of heterotrophic nutrition, 
um, and fungi, some fungi and bacteria are saprotrophs. And what this means is that you do digestion outside of the body. So you secrete digestive enzymes into the organic matter and then digest it externally. And then finally you absorb the products of digestion. So these are also known as decomposers. Um, and actually spiders also do saprotrophic nutrition. So that's interesting. Good. So archaea, we said they don't do photosynthesis. So what do they do? So archaea are unicellular and they have no nucleus. They are extremely diverse and they can be categorized based on their energy sources. So there's phototrophic archaea. These absorb light energy via pigments, uh, but not chlorophyll. So it's not photosynthesis. Okay. It's another mechanism, uh, but it works similarly. They can be chemotrophic, meaning that they oxidate inorganic materials, um, chemicals, for example, um, iron, and then heterotrophic, where they oxidate carbon compounds obtained from other organisms. So heterotrophic is what we've been talking about, right? Basically eating other organisms. And these two are new, um, just you need to remember them, unfortunately. <laughs> Great. And then let's look at how diet affects dentition, your teeth. So if we look at the family hominidae, that's where humans are. Uh, so it includes humans and some apes. Some are exclusively herbivorous, so they only eat plants, such as uh, gorillas, seen up here. And some are omnivorous, such as humans, uh, seen down here. And there's a relationship between the, the teeth, as I mentioned. So the teeth of herbivores tend to be large and flat. Uh, you can probably see it here. Uh, so they're large and flat because you need to chew hard vegetables, whereas omnivores have a mix of different types of teeth. So we have flat molars in the back of our mouth and then sharper front teeth so we can eat both. Good. Talking more about herbivores, so what are some adaptations of herbivores? So leaf-eating insects show adaptations. So on one hand, some have tubul tubular mouth parts, as you can see here, the aphids, and they basically pierce leaves to reach the flow and then suck it up. Some have mouth parts that resemble a jaw, and then they can bite off and chew leaves, for example. But plants have also developed adaptations to stop herbivore attacks. So, for example, some have spines or thorns, such as the rose, and others have chemicals which act as toxins to cause pain. However, at the same time, some herbivores have metabolic adaptations that allow them to detoxify uh, these toxins. So you can see how there's an, an arms race of sorts, right, uh, through evolution in which adaptation arises and then there's a counter adaptation. Similarly, we're going to see in predators and prey. So um, this is for carnivorous um, organisms. Looking at predators first, so vampire bats shown here have large incisors and canines, so that's teeth, and that's used to pierce uh, through prey and feed on their blood. <laughs> Then black mambas, shown here, a type of snake, produce venom, which paralyzes the prey. And then grizzly bears wait at the top of waterfalls for fish to jump out of the water. So that's a behavioral adaptation, right? And then some adaptation of prey, we have here buff tip moths. So they resemble twigs, as you can see, and that's a way of camouflage. Then caterpillars can have black and yellow stripes, warning predators that they're dangerous. And then blue striped snappers, it's a type of fish, they swim in a tight group, uh, they're called schools, and that makes threats easier to detect. Good. And then finally, uh, let's look at some adaptations of plants. So in environments where there is enough water and temperatures are suitable for photosynthesis, such as the jungle, plants are competing for light. That's the thing that's limiting them. So what are some adaptations? Well, they're going to have a dominant leading shoot that grows rapidly, known as the main trunk, uh, and that grows to great height to reach the canopy, right? The upper layer uh, where they are unshaded by other trees. But at the same time, they're going to have lianas, as you can see here, right? These lianas, which climb through trees, using them for support, and then don't need, so they can go up where the light is, but they don't need to build an entire trunk. There's also epiphytes. So you can see epiphytes here and also here. And so epiphytes are basically plants that grow on trunks and the branches of trees. So they receive higher light intensity than if they grew on the forest floor. And they're normally small plants. Uh, there's also strangler epiphytes, okay, so that's shown here, this one encircling the tree. So what these do is they climb up trees, again encircling them, and then they shade out the leaves of the actual tree, eventually killing it. Um, and then finally, there's shade-tolerant shrubs, and these are shown in the bottom. So uh, these are just plants that don't need as much light, so they can survive um, on the floor.
it's one and three. Why? Because two doesn't make sense. So uh, production of toxic secondary compounds wouldn't help you eat plants because plants, um, you don't need to paralyze, right, or kill. Uh, in any case, you would produce antitoxins. So that's three, right? Proteins that bind to toxins to inhibit them. And then uh, one makes sense because cellulose is part of plants, so you need to be able to digest it if you're going to eat them. Moving on, so the next question is, which of the following statement about ecological niches is true? Again, think, pause here. I'm going to count down in three, two, and one. An ecological niche can be shared between two species. Remember the concepts of the fundamental niche and the realized niche. You can go back if you don't remember. Um, whereas in A, A does not make sense. A uh, reduces the size of the realized niche, but not the actual ecological fundamental niche. Then uh, competition for a niche always results in local extension. That's not true. They can share the niche, remember. And then a realized niche is larger than a, larger than a fundamental niche. It's the other way around. And finally, which cellular feature can be indicative that an organism is an autotroph? Again, three, two, and one. It's the chloroplast. I think this one's quite obvious, right? If you have chloroplasts, you can do photosynthesis so you can create your own food. The rest are shared by most eukaryotic cells, all eukaryotic cells actually, and is not indicative of being able to produce your own food. Okay, amazing. I know this uh, topic is a bit uh, all over the place. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. And until then, I'll see you next week. Best of luck.